<laughs> okay. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, scripture reading time. Brother Linnell Benson will come forth with the reading of, the, of Genesis, and Sister Sandy Hill is going to come forth with the reading of Matthew. Good morning, church. And before I read the scripture, um, Monica wanted me to send a message to her church family. And she wanted to thank everyone for the cards, calls, and text messages that she received in the passing of her sister. So continue to keep Monica, and as well as all families that are grieving in prayer. Amen? Amen. Um, I'll be reading the scripture, which is taken from Genesis 12, 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and then all the families of the earth shall be blessed. As Abram went, as the Lord had told him, Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham took his wife Sarah and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they gathered and the persons whom they acquired in Haran. They set forth to the land of Canaan, where they come to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land to the place called Shemak, to the oak of Murray, at the time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your offspring, I will give you this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed on by the stages toward Nergad. Amen. Good morning, Coleman. You have to forgive me if I, I forgot my glasses, so if I should fall, I'm just going to ask Jesus to pick me up, okay? <laughs> just pick me up. I'm going to be reading Matthew 9, 9 through 13, and 18 through 26. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collection station, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. As he, sat at dinner, as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him and his disciples. Then suddenly a woman came who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, if, only, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that moment. When Jesus came to the leader's house, and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put, but when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout all of the district. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. 
Amen. Now, now it's going to be time for a selection from the men's choir. And the next voice that you will hear will be that of Sister Judy Pelham, not only our First Lady, a lay servant as well. Hear ye, hear ye, the word of God. I thank you for allowing me to be your worship leader this morning. And go in peace in the rest of the week. I made it this far by the 
God's grace. Amen. That's how any of us ever makes it. It's not on our own. It's by the grace of God that we get to where we get to. And God carries us through all circumstances, good, bad, and indifferent. And so we're grateful for the choir this morning and for this last song and the first song, Blessed Assurance, and the ones in between, um, because it truly is amazing when we think about the worship that we experience and how the Holy Spirit pulls it together for us. And so I am certainly grateful this morning for our choir, our Reverend Smith, and our men, and our choir leader, and, and for you um, who have participated along for our worship leader, Sister Moore, and thank you to our scripture readers, Brother Benson and Sister Hale, and prayer, Brother Robbins, thank you. And for this magnificent virtual team that we have that uh, allows us to go back and look at our, our worship and to sing along at different points during the week, and for those who aren't here to also participate. So I'm just really grateful, and to our ushers who make it possible for us to have the worship um, and the Holy Spirit worshiped in um, with us. So I just thank everyone um, and all who serve and who pray for this church. So grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I thank Reverend for trusting me to bring a message this morning. Uh, I am anxious, so I should put that out there, but... Hopefully, uh, by the time I start to speak about what I'm speaking about, I will be less anxious. Please pray with me. Wondrous God, thank you for this moment when we depend on you for this message. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Recently, I met two people within the last month who, who were telling me and, and talking about how much they loved God. However, both individuals were very troubled. Their struggle was how to be obedient disciples of Jesus Christ. And it was interesting that I met them at different times in different parts of the country. Um, and yet, the question that they had was, how do I serve Christ and be faithful and obedient? So I'm going to call the first person Rebecca. That is not her name, um, but I'm calling her Rebecca. And the second person I will call Robert, and that is not his name. Um, Rebecca had a rocky early life. She basically described a number of details to me about her life, but her summary statement was that her life was she had been a mess, that she had been a mess in the world and with her family and with her friends, she was a mess in the past. And now, as a born-again Christian, she was worried about the salvation of two of her family members. One family member was sick, and one was healthy, and was functioning well in the world. Reportedly, she had witnessed to them on numerous occasions about Christ, and she was told in no uncertain terms by these relatives they didn't want to hear any more from her about her Christ. They didn't want to hear any more about salvation. They didn't want to hear any more about what could happen to them after they passed from this life. The second person whom I call Robert was a longtime Christian who wanted to please God, so he was waiting to hear from God about what God wanted him to do. Now, Robert reported that he was reading and meditating on Scripture, that he was faithful with that, but he seemed to be frozen in place 
Robert was waiting for a specific call. Meanwhile, lots of time and life passed. Occupationally and socially, Robert was planted in what I might have thought would have been rich mission field. For example, in his settings, many young people of various ages, life stages, and experiences were present. And they responded extremely well to this longtime Christian, Robert. These young people were in his family. He encountered them in the workplace and in social environment. Robert functioned well and was responsible, but didn't recognize or value his daily, weekly, and monthly efforts as activities that were pleasing to God. He didn't see the places he lived, worked, and socialized as being a part of his mission field. Robert performed many good works, but didn't see them as connected to what God called him to do. He simply didn't see it. He thought there was a separation between the part of his life where he lived all the time and something that God would have expected of him as this Christian. Robert was asking for something more, something else, something different. So what to do? God has given us assignment, work to do, commandment, make disciples, teach the word of God, baptize, share the commandments that Jesus gave to them, and don't hold anything back. Take care of the environment. I mean, just this week, the wildfires in Canada created poor air quality in the Northeast and here in Delaware. So we see the impact of our treatment of the environment and air quality. Minister to the least of those among us. Be a voice for the voiceless. Respond to those who are powerless and need representation and uplifting. Love your neighbor as yourself, and so on and so on. What stops us from doing these assignments? If we have started the work, what interrupts our effort? What besides the commands and assignments in Scripture do we need? Do we trust God enough? I don't know if you've ever been on a, quote, trust walk, but during the 60s and 70s, which, of course, I was in college and after um, companies and college campuses, there were these things called trust walks. And they were frequently used to build teams and trust between individuals. Essentially, the goal of the trust work walk is to practice developing trust between teams or group members, to practice developing trust between teams or group members. Now, there are different ways to do a trust walk. Often, one person leads a blindfolded person around using verbal or nonverbal instructions to guide the person around obstacles. Now, if your leader has you stumbling over tree roots or into branches if you are outside, or walking into walls and banging into doorways, or falling up or down the stairs, you would rightly have trouble trusting their word about that which you didn't see with your own eyes or experience personally. It would make sense. The questions for us today, do you trust God? And can God trust you to obey when called to go and follow Christ? Can God trust you and me to do what God has already called us to do? In today's scripture lessons, I was struck by two people God called to go and to follow. Genesis 12, verse 1 said, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. God told Abraham to leave his country and his family's home, and go to an unknown place. God did not tell Abraham where he was sending him, but said, go where I will show you. Something similar happened with Jesus as one of his and one of his recruits. Matthew 9, verse 9 reads, As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. 
Both Abraham and Matthew obeyed God's call. Genesis 12, verses 4 through 8 reads, essentially, So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Abram took his wife, Sarai, and his brother's son, Lot, and all their possessions, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Abram's response to God was obedience and worship. Verse 8 of Genesis 12 says, Abram invoked the name of the Lord, meaning that Abram worshiped God and pray, with prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. So in addition to going where he was told, Abraham went. And then when he arrived at two different places, he established an altar and he worshiped God. Now, this passage was personally interesting to me. Um, I was born in Virginia, and my mom and dad moved around very often in the state of Virginia. However, around 1956 or 57, some of you weren't even thought of then, I know, my dad left my mom and my siblings and me, there were five children total at that time, and with my maternal grandparents, and went to northern New Jersey to find a job and a place for us to live. He wasn't gone very long before returning to get us. And I actually remember the trip back to Jersey. We had a live chicken in the car. I kid you not. I mean, we were from an agrarian society in Virginia, so what else would they give us? A ham sandwich? I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe today. But then it was a live chicken. But imagine what Abraham did. Unlike my dad, Abraham didn't go ahead of his household. He obeyed God completely. He took everything, everyone, and everything they owned and set out to only God knew where. In the gospel lesson, Jesus calls Matthew to follow him. Now, I have to tell you about something about tax collectors. Matthew was a tax collector. Jews didn't respect tax collectors. Let me be more precise. Tax collectors were hated. And why were they hated, you ask? Because the oppressive occupying foreign enemy, the Roman Empire, hired Jews to collect taxes from Jews. And these taxes helped the Roman Empire prosper. Tax collectors charged, charged more than the taxes. They padded their pockets with inflated fees that were added to the collected taxes. Some tax collectors were independent, like Matthew. He was considered an independent tax collector. He didn't have others who worked for him. But if you read uh, about Zacchaeus and Luke, he was a chief tax collector, so he would have been really wealthy because he had a lot of independent tax collectors working for him and under him. But they were alienated from their community because of their practices and because of whom they were. And they were considered enemies of the Jews. But this hated, alienated person was called by Christ to be a disciple. And Matthew responded obediently and immediately to Jesus' call to follow. What type of trust must you have to go or to follow? How would you have responded? Abraham and Matthew were trustworthy, and they trusted and obeyed God. Now, perhaps you think something special was going on about Abraham and Matthew, something that may have caused them to be obedient. Nothing in Scripture supports that notion. In other words, there is no reason to believe that Abraham and Matthew differed from us. Scripture tells us that Abraham was called righteous, because of what he did, which was based on faith in God. Abraham believed in God and acted on that belief and was deemed righteous because of that belief and his action. Just like Abraham and Matthew, we are called to go and follow Christ. We are called on a trust walk with Jesus, not for a moment, but daily and over the course of our lives. 
Being a follower means we do the work of Jesus. It means we live to engender trust as disciples of Christ so that we can be examples to the world. Sometimes the only thing another person will see is what we do. Jesus' calling of Matthew affirms that no one is beyond the grace of God and that Christ can restore anyone. Why is it important for us to be trustworthy and obedient before God? One of the commandments that Christ gave us is to love our neighbor as ourselves. This command doesn't mean we continue to share the gospel with those who've told us to stop. And it doesn't also mean that we turn our back on them because they no longer want to hear our words about Christ. Perhaps they are saying, stop talking so much about Christ and show me Christ in you. Discipleship means being a follower. One writer wrote that Jesus said, follow me more often than believe in me. Reverend Weber proposed that life is characterized by our struggle to respond to the call to follow Jesus. Now, if you read the book about Mother Teresa, there's a book called um, Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light, The Private Writings of the Saint of Calcutta. You will have an example of the inner turmoil Mother Teresa experienced even as she served and ministered to the sick and dying in the slums of Calcutta. Jesus didn't say this was going to be easy, painless, comfortable. Jesus said, follow me. I was struck by the amount, though, of inner turmoil Mother Teresa had over her life as she served and ministered to the poor and the abandoned. What was most striking? Mother Teresa reportedly did not feel God's presence for about 50 years, half a century, except for five weeks in 1959. Words in the biography used to describe this included dryness, darkness, loneliness, and torture. However, Mother Teresa continued to serve even while sharing these painful experiences with her mentor. However, the public didn't know about that. The public didn't see that. The public saw her being obedient and faithful. So what do we do? Well, we use Jesus as our model. Do what Jesus did. Daily continue developing a closer relationship with God through prayer and scripture. Transform your mind to the urgings of the Holy Spirit and practice the spiritual disciplines. But do this as you perform the work that Christ already gave you. God gave Jesus a mission. God did not repeatedly remind Jesus of his mission. Yes, Jesus sought God through prayer and quiet meditative time. But Jesus stayed on his divine mission. In our everyday lives, what do we do? When relatives tell you to stop witnessing about Christ to them, love them and pray for their healing in their mind, their body, and their spirit. Forgive them for the past hurts they may have inflicted on you. And forgive yourselves for the past hurts you inflicted on them. Focus on the love in your heart for them. If they are sick, help as you are able. Listen to them, laugh with them, and cultivate a new, clean, but God-inspired relationship. Move forward. Wait for a call from God. Continue reading and meditating on the scriptures. Pray and look for God's guidance. And try to recognize the mission field in which you may already be planted. A daily relationship with Christ increases the opportunity to be guided by God. Now, as I close, summary, love your neighbor as yourself. Connect the love in your heart with your action. Forgive others and forgive yourself. Seek a close relationship with Christ, and you will experience the presence and guidance of God in new and unique ways. God equips you. The followers of Jesus are called to ministry. God gave you work to do. God will enable you to do the work. 
God gave us scripture through Jesus and the apostles. We have the church. God gave us the ability to reason, to understand, and discern the urgings of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Trust God. God is waiting for you to act. That includes you and you and you and you. Amen. So now it's it's an opportunity for us um, to respond to the message. And the first call would be to those who don't have a church home and, or who may not know, who don't know Christ and who are wanting to know Christ. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. However, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now's a really good time to come forth and to extend yourself to us so that we might help you connect your spirit with the spirit of Christ. That's the first call. second call is you know Jesus Christ however you're looking for a church home and you sense that Coleman would be a good place for you and so we're now calling you giving you the opportunity to come forth and let us know and if you're on live stream it's a great opportunity to let us know in the chat or at some later time that you would like to respond to one of those two calls third call is for prayer. Perhaps you are concerned about your walk, your call, your ministry, and now would be a good time to come forth and perhaps pray for yours or pray for someone else's walk or call. Maybe someone is ill. Maybe you've had a rough week, a rough month, a rough season in your life. Now's a good time have a personal time with Christ. And you don't have to walk forward. You may sit in your seat. You may stand. Um, Christ will hear you wherever you are. And so now is prayer time. Merciful and loving God, we just thank you for your presence in our lives and in this service and in this place. We thank you for how you guide us forward, how you look out for us, and we thank you for calling us, for challenging us to follow you. Almighty God, you know our hurts and our hearts and our concerns. You know that sometimes we even worry rather than give up our concerns to you. And so we ask you at this point of our service that we are allowed and able to give to you all that's on our heart and to trust you, Almighty God, with it. Help us to leave it with you. Help us not to pick it back up. Help us to know that because you love us and because you have called us, and because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and because of Christ, that you have put us here to do something, and you don't want us burdened and frozen and stopped from doing what it is that you have called us to do. And so we ask you, in the magnificent name of Christ, strengthen us, put your arms around us, uphold us, and help us to see clearly where we are going as we follow you. And when we can't see where we're going, when we don't have a path that's clear, help us to listen to you. Help us to know that you never leave us alone, nor do you lead us astray. And so we thank you, Almighty God, 
for what you are doing in our lives. Comfort those who have lost and comfort us as we mourn the loss of our sisters in Christ. Thank you for the way that you share our lives with each other. You give us a time that we're here and you give us the opportunity to have an impact and to be a part of your kingdom building. And so we just thank you for that. The psalmist said, who is man that you are mindful of him? And yet, you give us so much and you expect stuff from us. And so we ask you to help us to move forward in confidence, trusting you as we go. Almighty God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these individuals who are in service and who worship you. Be with us as we go forth. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. don't want Christ to do it without us. Are there any additional announcements before we end today? Mr. Trotter? Thank you. Thank you. Wow, 102 years. Yes. Praise God. Okay, is that is that anything else? Okay. All right. Please stand as you're able for the benediction. gathering. Hear God's call to go. Go into the uncertainty of the journey ahead, trusting that of this you can be certain. God is with us, and we are sent out together. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good job. Good job.